Hello, everyone. Uh, today, in, we're going to cover um, section 16.3, uh, the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Uh, this is going to build on the previous section when, where we learned about line integrals. Uh, we're going to continue with line integrals, and we're going to develop something similar to the fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals. Okay. So for certain types of line integrals, we have something similar to the fundamental theorem of calculus. And remember what that is, for those of you, you know, I'm sure you've heard the term, maybe you don't remember what that is. Uh, there's a couple versions of it, but essentially it, if we integrate a derivative, um, the integral and the derivative cancel out and we get this nice way to evaluate our integrals, FB minus FA. Okay, so we're going to develop something similar for line integrals. Now, this this fundamental theorem of calculus that's just for our normal uh, functions of a single variable, or you know, uh, integrating with respect to you know dx, not not doing anything with line integrals. So we got to develop this a little bit. Okay, so recall that we're talking about. Uh, vector fields and we're integrating um, this vector field over uh, a certain curve. And um, we're gonna mostly deal with vector fields that are conservative. Remember what that means. We defined that in um, the end of the last section. So if I have a vector field F, okay, uh, that's gonna be, we're gonna call that a conservative vector field. If this vector field is actually the gradient of some other function, which we would call a potential function. Okay. So let's assume we have a, a conservative vector field. So we'll, we'll often write just del, um, del F instead of the capital F. So the, the types of line integrals we're gonna be looking at are something like this, where we're talking about integrals along a curve and uh, remember how we deal with that, what this notation means. We, we look at our curve, you know, a curve C, and we come up with a parameterization of that curve. And it doesn't matter what parameterization we use. You know, we, we turn this into a, a parameterized curve with start, you know, start point at A, end point at B, okay? And then we, we change our X's and maybe there's X's and Y's in here. We change those to term in, to terms of uh, our parameter, which is why we have del F of R of T here. And then we take the dot product with the, uh, the derivative of our uh, parameterized curve. Okay. And then we integrate with respect to T. So this is just from last section. Now think about this in terms of chain rule, okay? So uh, think about the interior of the, the, um, the integral here. What is, what is this del F here? Look at this, we have del F, the gradient of F of RT and then R prime of T out here. Well, think of the gradient as essentially uh, a derivative. Right. So think about this in terms of uh, single variable functions. We essentially have f prime of r of t times r prime of t. That looks like chain rule, right? And this that that would mean that that this is the derivative of what? Derivative with respect to t of f of r of t. So we're integrating a derivative. And that's essentially what's going on. So it seems like we should have some result similar to fundamental theorem of calculus. And we would expect that to give us, you know, the integral and the uh, derivative would cancel out, right? So we have the integral of our conservative vector field. So we got our gradient of f dot dr, which remember that that is just notation for this. Okay, and we're saying that this is essentially the derivative of um, F of R of T, okay. And in fact, that, you know, uh, is gonna work out like it, like we would hope the integral and the, uh, the integral and the derivative cancel out. And I should be left with F of R of B, 
minus f of r of a. Okay. And this is exactly what we call the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So it makes evaluating these line integrals very nice. Um, it doesn't always work though. So this this is uh, this this relies on the fact uh, or on the on the idea that we have a conservative vector field that this is um, the gradient of some function f. So in in the previous section we saw you know a lot of line integrals and we calculated some of them, but not all of them were conservative. Meaning, yeah, we did a lot of uh, line integrals like this. Okay, oh, I'm missing our prime of t. We did a lot of line integrals like this in the previous section, but this capital F was not the gradient of anything. Okay, and this was not equal to, you know, the gradient of some little function F. Okay, this is just a function in its own right. It's not the, this wasn't the, the gradient of anything. So for this this to work, we need this thing to be the gradient. We need this this uh, function capital F, this vector field. We need that to be a conservative vector field. We need it to be the gradient of some multivariable function little f. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is this theorem only holds when we have uh, a gradient in here. Or, you know, we might not always write it in this notation, but the vector field we have in here, you know, I could still write it like this, but this, this vector field has to be the gradient of something. Okay. okay. Now, the great thing about this theorem is we only need the endpoints. We only need knowledge about the endpoints, right? Uh, we don't have to um, look at all the, the points along our curve in between, okay? And that's, that's huge. <clears throat> so as, as I was saying, we, we only evaluate using the endpoints, okay? So what does that mean? Let's say I have a vector field, you know, F that gives me a vector at, you know, each of these points, you know, on the plane. Okay, every single point, we have an out input, uh, we have an output for that input. And let's say that we have one of these conservative vector fields. So F is actually the gradient of some little function, uh, some little F, okay? Well, what if I take the, the um, line integral along this curve, okay? Let's say, you know, this is point X1, y1, and this is the point x2, y2, okay? So I take the, uh, I take the line integral along this curve, okay? So I come up with my parameterization for my curve, r of t, and then I can write this point like x1 of t, y1 of t, actually, let's see, I should write like x1 of a, y1 of a, and then this point I could rewrite as x2 of, you know, this is the end point, x2 of b, y2 of b. Okay, so I just rewrite the end points uh, in terms of this parameter t, okay. And then I take the line integral. Okay, and I take the line integral along this curve, you know, call it C1. Okay, I take the line integral and our result only depends on the endpoints, right? So we get F of, R of B minus F of R of A. Okay. Well, R of B, you remember that's just a way to write that endpoint X2, Y2. Okay, so we're really, I just have X2, Y2 minus F of X1, Y1. Okay, 
perfect. But now what happens if I draw another curve between those two points? What if instead of take uh, what instead of considering the line integral along that curve, I just consider the line integral along this straight line? What happens? Okay, so now I would have a new parameterization. Okay, so let's see, I've, I've already written it down here. Okay, so this is what we just did. Let's say I, I take this, I find this curve C2. Let's call this one C1, this one C2. Okay, well, I'd have a new parameterization, you know, for a parameterization for that curve. Let's call it, you know, S of P instead of R of T. Okay, and I would write these, I could write these endpoints again as, let's say, you know, I could call this endpoint x of c, y of c, and this endpoint x of d, y of d. Okay, and then I, I take the integral the line integral along that curve. But again, it just, when I evaluate it, it just matter, all that matters are the endpoints. Okay, so I get this. And remember this S of D, S of C, well, the, that's just the, you know, that just becomes my, actual point here. So really, Now our answer will depend on the parameterization, but really they're gonna be the same thing. So we see we have two different curves, but they're giving us the same exact value. They will give us the same exact numerical value. Okay. So we see that it doesn't matter in this case, when we have this conservative vector field, it doesn't matter which path we take uh, between our endpoints. Okay, the, the answers will be the same. So we have this concept of independence of path. Okay, so the path we take doesn't matter. We always get the same result. It just matters what we, when we're evaluating, we just use the endpoints. That's all that matters. Now, independence of path, that, that doesn't, if, if we have a conservative vector field, we are gonna have independence of path, but we could also have you know, just this concept of independence of path without a conservative vector field. Okay, so the question is, um, when does one imply the other? Uh, we're going to explore that a little bit. First, let's focus on let's focus on independence of path for a second. Okay. Well, let me just write down what I, what I just said. So if we have a conservative vector field, meaning f is the gradient of some function, little f, we're gonna have independence of path. If I have independence of path, do I have a conservative vector field? That's the question. And we're gonna address that for a second in a, in, a, in a little bit. But first, let's just look at this idea of independence of path just by itself. If we have independence of path, Think about what that means for um, these closed curves. You know, a closed curve is a curve where the endpoints intersect. So the starting point is the same as the endpoint. Okay. So let's say I have this curve and this yellow dot is the, the starting point, and I go around counterclockwise and I come back to that starting point. Okay. If I have independence of path, what is the line integral along that curve? Well, it's just going to be zero, right? If I have independence of path and I take the uh, line integral along that curve, okay, well, in, when I have independence of path, all I care about is the endpoints. So I'm essentially going to have, you know, whatever, uh, I'm going to integrate and get some function f. I'm going to take its value at the endpoint, you know, f of b, 
Okay, and then I subtract its uh, value at the endpoint f of a, which you know f of a is also that yellow point. So I can expect that that line integral to be zero, right? Now that's not necessarily true for vector fields in general, just when they have this independence of path property. Okay, so we have that stated in a little theorem here. Let's say uh, we have a line integral, okay? And we're integrating some vector field F. We don't know if it's conservative or not. Uh, let's say it's independent of path, okay? Well, it's gonna be independent of path if and only if its integral along a closed curve is always zero. Okay. okay, so let's let's digest this a bit. What does if and only if mean? I, I think I've talked about this um, before, but we can divide this theorem up into two statements. Okay, this, and then we have an if and only if, and then we have this statement. If and only if means this implies this and this implies this, okay? So you can break it up into your mind into two statements. If this line integral is independent of path, then the uh, line integral along a closed curve is always zero. Okay, so let's assume, let's assume this top thing, uh, our, our uh, line integral is independent of path. And then I draw, a, you know, it doesn't matter, I draw a closed curve. It doesn't matter where I draw it. Okay, okay if our uh, line integral is independent of path, when I in take the line, this, this uh, when I integrate this uh, along this closed curve, I get zero. Okay. On the other hand, let's assume that I have this. Let's assume this. Okay. Whenever I'm integrating a closed curve, I'm getting zero. Okay. Well, then I'd like to show that my uh, line integrals are independent of path. So let's let's pick any two points. You know, this is a it's a this is the way the uh, proof is laid out in the book, and it's it's pretty intuitive. Let's pick any two points. Okay, how how do I show how do I show that something's independent of path? I'm going to pick any two points, completely arbitrary points, and I would like to show that no matter what curve connects these two points, I get the same uh, line integral along those two curves. Okay, so let's call this, you know, this curve C1 going from A to B, okay. And then let's call this curve C2, okay. Well, when I combine curves C1 and C2, that becomes a closed curve, right? So I know that the integral along C1 and so the integral along the closed curve is going to be zero, right? Because I've assumed this. Okay. Well, that must mean that the integral along C1 plus the integral along C2 is equal to zero, right? That's what this is which means the integral along C1 is the negative of the integral along C2, okay? So we have going from A to B is the opposite of going from B to A. 
But now just reverse the direction of C2. Instead of, instead of going from B to A, go from A to B. So basically just change the arrow of direction. Okay. If we reverse the direction, we just change the sign for line integrals. Okay. So we see that the integral along C1 from A to B is the same as integral along C2 from A to B. Okay. And what does that mean? That means independence of path. So a nice little proof there. Okay. Now, uh, we have seen this, this isn't what we just have shown, but uh, a little bit ago, we saw that line integrals of vector fields are independence of path. And now we'd like to see the, is the opposite true? So that goes back to this, okay? So we saw that conservative vector fields are independent of path, is the opposite true? Okay, so now let's, let's address that issue. So let's suppose capital F is a continuous vector field on an open connected region D. Okay, what does open connected region mean? Uh, don't worry about it too much. It's, um, a, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, eh, worry about it a little bit, I guess, but what does open connected region mean? Essentially, I can uh, draw, uh, a curve between any two points in um, my region. Okay. So, you know, maybe that curve is, has a lot of twists and turns in it. For, in, for instance, let's say I have the, let's say the yellow thing is my domain. Okay. And there's a hole right there that's not in my domain so like this is not my domain and then all this stuff out here is not in my domain there okay. so i can't draw a straight let's see i can't draw a straight line between points a and b but i could draw you know some curve between points a and b okay that's going to be important in a little bit So let's assume we have one of these uh, regions. Now, uh, if if the uh, in, the line integral um, of our vector field is independent of path everywhere on our domain, then um, our vector field is going to be conservative. Okay. Sorry about that. I had to run and do something real quick. So we see uh, we have the converse of our of our statement, right? We have okay. If we have a conservative vector field, it's going to be independent of path. And if our uh, uh, vector field is independent of path, it's conservative. Okay. As long as this f is continuous, that's you know fairly straightforward. Not it's not really a it's not really much trouble to assume this. You know, most of the vector fields we're looking at are going to be um, continuous. Uh, so we have our, our statement going both ways. Okay. Now the the proof for this this is theorem what uh, theorem four in the book. It uh, is fairly interesting. I would check it out if you like. It's it relies on this independence of path um, to construct something we can differentiate to get our uh, function f that we see in our integral. It's it's pretty cool, I'll check that out. Um, I don't wanna do it here just because it, I'll probably uh, muddy the waters a little bit and trying to make this kind of streamlined. Okay, so we see that, yeah, uh, if a vector field is conservative, it is independent of path, and 
if our vector field is in pen and path, then it's conservative, you know, with, with this added assumption that we have a continuous vector field on an open connected region. Okay. Um, now, that's all well and good. Oh, what did I just do? Uh, that's all well and good, but um, let's say our goal, let's say our goal is um, to determine if a vector field is conservative, right? Let's say we have, let's say I have some vector field F and I wanna figure out, is this conservative or not? And this is uh, something we commonly want to know. It's, you know, conservative vector fields are very nice. They have very nice properties. So we want to be able to look at a vector field and tell if it's conservative or not. Okay. So what have we seen? We've seen that if it's independent of path on this, you know, it's continuous, it's independent of path on an open connected region, then it's going to be conservative, right? But the problem is checking if it's independent of path we could we could try to check if f is independent of path right because if it's independent of path then it's going to be um conservative problem is okay what do we need to do to check if it's independent of path we would need to look at every possible curve between every pair of points in the domain and all, make sure all those integrals come out to the same thing. Okay. So that'd be, you know, it's impossible, right? Because there's an infinite number of um, pairs of points and there's an infinite number of curves in between those points. Yeah, it's not doable, right? So this, this we couldn't do. Okay, maybe we'd be tempted to, but we couldn't do it. So we'd like some other criteria for determining if F is conservative. Okay, and that's that's uh, what the remainder of this little section is about. Yeah, let's see. I guess that's where I'll stop my expo, you know, my my lecture, and then we'll do I'll do some problems at the end of this video. Um, so we're we're trying to develop some uh, techniques to determine if F is conservative or not. We're going to see uh, one here, and then we're going to see some more in later sections, but. For a second, let's assume that we have a conservative vector field. Let's look at uh, this conservative vector field and look at some of the properties. Okay. Suddenly I'm paranoid I'm not recording my voice or something. Let's see. Okay. No, am I recording? Yes, good. So let's assume we have a conservative vector field. Let's look at a major property of these conservative vector fields. So let's say this is our conservative vector field. Okay, so remember what this what a, a vector field is. Fxy, it's a function from R2 to R2. We're focused on the R2 to R2 case. Okay. So its input is R2, its output is R2. Okay. What does that mean? It means, okay, uh, f of x, y, the output is going to be a vector. And I can break that vector down into two functions, right? Where f1 and f2 are functions from r2 to r1. Okay. Now I've written f1 and f2, and your book uses you know, p and q, same thing. So your vector field looks like this. It takes your point x, y, and then for each component of the vector, you have a function. And that uh, function takes a numerical value, and that's how you get your vector. OK. Now, uh, let's assume we have this conservative vector field. 
And these functions here have continuous first order partial derivatives, right? Okay. Then dp over dy is going to be equal to dq over dx. Why? We're saying f is conservative, right? So f is the gradient of some function little f. And on the other hand, f is equal to, let's kind of reorient this. So we're saying f is the gradient of some function little f. On the other hand, just from the outset, we have, okay, f is p of x, y, q of x, y, right? So we have this so far. And remember what gradient is. Gradient is fx, fy, right? Partial derivative with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to y. So forget about this stuff in the middle. We have this is equal to this. So p is the you know derivative uh, with respect to x of f and q is the derivative with respect to y and then what are we assuming we're assuming that these are differentiable right in other words our function little f has f has second order partial derivatives okay so if i differentiate these let's say i differentiate this what would i get i would get Let's say I differentiate with respect to y, I'll get p y x. Or excuse me, I get p y, right? If I differentiate this with respect to y, I get p y. But what is p y? Well, p is f of x, and then I'm taking the derivative with respect to y, I get f y of x. Okay. Now look at q. I differentiate with respect to x, and I get what? q x. But what is Q? Q is Fy. So I differentiate Fy with respect to X, I get Fxy. Okay. And what do we know? As long as these uh, second order partials are um, continuous, we have Clairaut's theorem, right? That says these things are gonna be equal, these mixed partials. Okay. So that's what this theorem is saying. It's saying fy of x is going to be equal to fxy. So again, I have a vector field. It's conservative, meaning it's the gradient of some fu function little f. Okay, we can write our vector field as p plus pi plus qj. Okay, and if I take the uh, derivatives of these, that's going to give me the second order derivatives of little f, and those things should be equal. Okay, so if I take the derivative with respect to y of this, that should equal the derivative with respect to x of this. Okay. So if f, if capital F is conservative, then this has to be true. I mean, well, it, it has to be true as long as um, these are differential. Okay. So if f is conservative and these are differentiable, then this, has to be true. If this is not true, then capital F can't be a conservative vector field. Okay, so this is going to be, we're going to use this theorem to test whether something's a conservative vector field or not. And really what, what we're going to do is we're going to check this condition. If it's not true, uh, our vector field is not going to be conservative. And I'll, we'll, we'll work some problems like that at the end. Now let's check out the next theorem. Okay, this is theorem six. Now, this is nice. This theorem is nice. Um, if we have a conservative vector field, then we have this equality here. Okay, again, we might be wondering about the converse. Let's say, what if we have this equality? Does that mean uh, the vector field is conservative? Uh, yes, but it, we have to be careful. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's a little bit restricted, okay? So on the other hand, let's assume 
uh, capital F is a vector field with these components. Okay, so we're, now we're not assuming it's conservative. It's just a vector field. We want to determine if it's conservative or not. Um, let's assume it's a vector field on an open, simply connected region in D. Okay, so what does simply connected mean? What did I just do? I think I hit the close button on my iPad. Anyway, so what is a what is a simply connected region? A simply connected region. Remember, let's see. We have this as a, a connected region, right? I can connect any two points with a um, some sort of curve. But this this uh, this region, which was just connected, had uh, it had this hole in the middle, right? Simply connected regions can't have holes in them and they can't have any like twists or kinks in them. So I couldn't have like, I couldn't have a region, you know, I couldn't have a region like this that kind of like crossed over itself. Okay, I can only have these closed curves as our borders with no holes. You know, I can't have a hole in the middle. Okay, so it's, fairly intuitive when you see these things, whether they're uh, uh, simply connected or not. Okay. Okay, so let's assume we have one of these simply connected regions. Um, and we're going to also assume that P and Q, these things are continuous. Okay. And further, we're going to assume that they have continuous first order partial derivatives. Okay, so they're not only continuous, they have continuous first order partials. Okay. And then we're also going to assume that these things are equal. Oops. So what are we assuming? Uh, we have a simply connected region. These things have continuous first order, continuous first order partials, and that these uh, partials are equal. Okay. Then F is going to be conservative. Okay. So, you know, we we could check. You know, if we, if we were given a vector field, we could check all these conditions fairly easily. You know, if they give us the domain, we could check that it's simply connected. You know, we could look at these things and determine if they have if they have first order partials and if they're continuous and then we could you know check if they're always equal um, and if all those conditions hold yeah the vector field is going to be conservative okay so at this point I think we have all the the theorems and results we need now let's do some problems and let's let's uh, just turn to um, the end of the chapter and let's work some of these problems Okay, so, uh, and this should be what you're going to see on WebAssign as well. So, and then as, as we need some other, there's some material in here about work and conservation of energy, we'll do some problems like that and address those topics as they come up. Okay, so let's try problem three. So the problem statement is determine whether or not F is a conservative vector field. If it is, find a function such that uh, little f equals, uh, find a function little f such that its gradient is equal to f. All right, so this is interesting. Um, th these problems uh, cover a couple of topics I wanted to show you guys. So. 
maybe we determine that this is conservative, you know, the next step is, okay, what's, what's the potential function? What's the function little f such that its gradient is equal to f? Can we figure that out? Yeah, we can. Okay. First step, let's determine if this is conservative or not. How do we do that? We're gonna use that version of Clairaut's theorem, okay? If capital F is conservative, then these mixed partials should be equal, right? The derivative of P with respect to Y should be equal to the derivative of Q with respect to X. So the first thing to do is, you know, the first easiest thing to do is check that. If it's not true, it's not conservative. Okay. So what do I need to do? What's my P? This is my P. What's my Q? This is my Q. So I'm asking myself, does DP over DY equal DQ over DX? If this is not true, not conservative. Okay. So let's figure it out. Okay. Well, DP over DY. And really I should be taking, you know, this is a function of X and Y. So I should be taking uh, does, right? Not D's. Uh, partial derivative with respect to Y. Let's see, that'll become X plus two Y, right? What about do Q over do X? Well, let's see, I take the derivative of X squared plus two X Y, that becomes two X plus two Y. So not equal. So F is not conservative. And we're done with that problem. And just for my own sake of paranoia, let's see this is even problem. 16.3, number three, yep, not conservative. All right. Let's try four. Okay, so same problem statement, determine if it's conservative, if it is, find the potential function. Okay, so again, I wanna, this is my P, this is my Q. Does, this equality hold? Let's figure it out. All right, let's see what's uh, do P over do Y. That'd be what, 2y, right? What's do q over do x? That would be what, 2y. So does do p over do y equal do q over do x? Yes. Okay. Does this mean that it's a conservative vector field? Um, not quite, right? We would have, it's probably is, but let's, let's just, you know, be thorough here. Um, we said that if this equality doesn't hold, it's not uh, it's not conservative, right? What if the equality does hold? Does that mean it's automatically conservative? Well, that's where the second theorem comes in. If this equality holds, and we have we're on a simple connected region, then yes, it holds, right? Okay, so let's let's check this other stuff. Uh, are we given a domain? We're not, we're not given a region D, right? Um, and there's no restrictions to the domain in our problem. Like we don't have one over X or LNs of negative numbers. There's no restriction to the domain. So it seems like the region we're talking about is just all of R2, okay? All right. Um, Next, are P and Q, do they have continuous first order partials? Yes, 
Okay. All right. So this is true. This is true. And then we just checked that these things are equal. Okay. So yeah, this meets all our, our criteria. So this would be a conservative vector field, right? Now, the next part uh, of the problem statement is, let's see, the, the problem says, determine whether or not F is a conservative vector field. If it is, find a function, little f, find little f such that um, gradient, the gradient del f, del of little f is equal to capital F. What does that mean? Okay. So we have, this is the, uh, Let's just copy and paste this. This is our vector field, right? Okay. So that's our vector field. And we're saying it's a conservative vector field. So really this, this vector field is the gradient of some little f. Okay, so this stuff on the right side is the gradient of little f. Let's, let's, let's just rewrite that without the middleman. We have gradient of f is equal to y squared minus 2x. And I'm gonna write this in the vector notation, with vector brackets. We have this, right? What I wanna do is, what I wanna figure out what f is, okay? How do we do that? Well, some simple integration. All right, let's look at the partial derivatives here. Y squared minus two X. I know that this is FX, right? So if I integrate with respect to X, that should give me something close to F, okay? You would think maybe it would give you F right away, but it's not quite that simple. So let's integrate this with respect to X. And I guess first, let me let me explain the problem here. You would you would like to think that if I integrate the partial f sub x with respect to x, you would like to think that would just give me um, f straight away, right? But it doesn't. It would you know if if we were just talking about our normal single variable stuff, right? It would give us f plus a constant c, okay? But when we have these multivariable functions. It's not going to be a constant over here. It's going to be a function of the other variable, y. Okay. So when we were when we integrate with respect to uh, x, we're going to get the antiderivative plus. It's not a constant. It's going to be a function with respect to the variable y. Why is that? Think about things in reverse. Okay, let's say I have f plus a function of y, and I take the derivative with respect to x. Well, I'm going to get f of x, and then the derivative of that would be zero, right? Okay, so when I undo that um, differentiation, you know, I could end up with anything like this. Okay, so that's why we add this function of y. So now let's go through our machinery. We have y squared minus 2x. That's our uh, derivative with respect to x. I'm going to integrate that with respect to x. Okay. And what do I get? I get x y squared minus x squared plus some function of y. All right. Okay. So let's keep track of this. All right. We're not quite done. Now let's do the same process for f sub y. Similarly, I should, if I integrate f sub y with respect to y, I should get f plus a function, let's call it h of x, function of x. Okay. So let's integrate 2xy with respect to y. Okay, what is that going to be? It's going to be what, xy squared, right? plus some function of x. Now the key here is to get these things to match. Let's get two to match one. Okay. 
I want x y squared minus x squared plus g of y to equal x y squared plus h of x. Okay. How do you do this? First, <clears throat> let's look at what we have the same, right? This is on both sides. Okay, so we're good there. Now I have minus x squared on this side. And then over here, I have a h of x. Okay, so as long as this h of x is minus x squared, we're good. Okay. And then let's see, I have a function g of y over here, but there's nothing else over here, right? So as long as g of y is zero, we're good. Okay. So we see that f has to be x y squared minus x squared. That's the only way this will work out. And then we'd be done. That'd be it. All right, so that's a little weird. Let's try a couple more of these. Okay, we did four. Let's try five. So same problem statement. We have this. This is our vector field, right? All right, so first, first step, is this a conservative vector field? What do we need to do? This is our P, this is our Q. We need to check, does dou P over dou Y equal dou Q over dou X? Okay, so let's dou P over dou Y. Okay, that would be what, 2y, well, we gotta use product rule, right? So let's be careful here. 2y e x y plus um, y, uh, let's see, y squared, x y squared e x y. And then we could factor out the e x y as All right, what about dou Q over dou X? Okay, that'd be what? Uh, again, we have product rule. Okay, let's see, we would have Y, EXY plus one plus XY, Y, EXY, right? Okay, and let's just factor out the EXY. Okay. So our derivatives match, right? And I've just written these in different order here, but same thing. Okay, and then do all other conditions match? Again, we don't have any restrictions on the domain. Uh, these partials are um, continuous. Uh, so yeah, conservative. Next step, let's figure out, okay, what's the function What's the function f such that it's equal to our vector field? Okay. Let's do, let's try this copy and paste again. Okay. 
So this is our vector field. Okay, we've determined it is conservative. So this is fx, right? This term is fx. So I wanna try, I'm gonna use this information to start finding f, okay? So let's integrate fx with respect to x, okay? If I'm integrating with respect to x, y squared is a constant. So I can pull that out the integral. And then what's the integral of e to the xy? Will that be e xy over y, right? And then plus a function of y. Okay. Now let's integrate, this is fy, and let's integrate fy with respect to y. Okay. Now it might help to just go ahead and distribute this. So that integral is the same thing as e x y plus x y e x y dy, right? Okay, I can split this up into two integrals. Well, let's do that in the next line. Okay, what's this first integral? Um, okay, e, e to the xy over x. And then what's this integral? Again, treat x like a constant, pull it out of the integral. This would be a simple integration by parts. Let's see if I can do it in my head and not totally screw it up. It should be... X Y E the X Y over let's pull the X out front over X minus what E to the X Y over x squared, I think. Okay. And then multiply everything by x, and then I want to have a plus a function of x, right? Okay. Hmm. Here we go. These cancel. I was thought something was going wrong, but these cancel. I have e to the x y over x minus e to the x y over x. Those cancel. And so I have y e to the x y plus h of x. Okay. Now. I need to match that with y e to the x y plus g of y. So I need y e to the x y plus g of y to equal y e to the x y plus h of x. Okay. Well, let's see. These match already, so I just need these things to match. Okay, well, how about uh, zero or I suppose a constant, any constant would work. Let's see what the textbook wants. Okay. 
Yeah. So they just have they use a constant k. Okay. 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 So it's not a it's not a function of x or y. It's just a constant. So f is equal to y e to the x y plus a constant k. You know, if you wanted to use C, that's that'd be fine on the test. Um, web assign, they might tell you what to use for a constant. Okay. All right, successful. Let's move on. Um, let's try something like number 13. Okay. Now we're given fxy equals x squared y cubed i plus x cubed y squared j. We're, and then we're told to take the line integral told to take the line integral along the curve C where C is given by this vector value function. Okay. So in particular, we're told uh, what this is broken down into two parts. It says find little f such that f is equal to gradient of little f. And then use that to evaluate the line integral. Okay. So how can we evaluate this line integral? Okay, without actually going through and computing it all. Okay. First thing I'm going to do uh, is find a little f such that it's equal to this. Okay. So they tell us to find it, so we don't we don't have to prove that it is conservative. We just go ahead and find it from the beginning. Okay. So what's little f? What do I do? I integrate x squared y cubed with respect to x. What x cubed over three y cubed plus g of y. And then I integrate this with respect to at, uh, y. That's what x uh, cubed y cubed over three plus h of x. I set them equal to each other. Okay, these things are going to be equal as long as g of y is equal to h of x. So that means you know it has to be a constant. So my function little f is this. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. Uh, now I want to integrate along this um, this curve, right? And think about this. I'm integrating the the vector field dot dr along my curve c, and c is given by this. Now we know since this is a conservative vector field, it's independent of path, right? So all that matters is the uh, endpoints. So this is the endpoints of this curve are zero and one. So all I need to do is plug um, r of one into f and subtract away r of zero. Okay. So what's r of one? When I plug in one to this, I get what? One minus two, which is negative one. Uh, and then I get one plus two, which is three. On the other hand, r of zero should just be zero, zero, right? Yes. Okay. So I do f of negative one, three minus f of zero, zero, and that should give me my line integral. Okay. So let's see. f of negative one, three. Okay. This is my f. So negative one third times 27. OK. 
okay, plus k. No, the con when I evaluate the integral, the constant is canceled out. So I have this minus what's f of zero, zero? That's uh, zero, zero. No, excuse me, just zero. Ah, what's going on? Suddenly my iPad won't scroll down. Let's try and close some apps. Safari, that, that, that. Let's try and close notes again. What's zero, zero, that's zero. Okay, so I get negative one third times 27, which is negative nine minus zero. So my answer should be nine. Go into the book. What problem are we doing? 13. Yes, negative nine. Okay, I just looked at uh, WebAssign and apparently there are no physics examples on the web sign homework, thank goodness, because I, I really don't want to, you know, I'm not a physics person. Um, I prefer to look at these things from a pure mathematical standpoint. So I'm, I'm thankful that I don't have to look at the physics section of this um, section and uh, worry about those problems. So let's end there.